Today, we bring you an eyewitness account of the horrors of China's re-education camps. An ethnic Kazakh woman imprisoned like other Muslim minorities in camps, China calls vocational training centers, shares her story. Her crime, being a Muslim minority in China's Northwest. The story of these camps in China's Xinjiang province is one we have reported on for at least two years. Set up ostensibly, according to the Chinese government, to offer voluntary education and training, they housed at least a million Uyghur, Kazakh and other ethnic Muslim minorities, all being de-radicalized as part of China's measures to counter terrorism. Before we show you our interview with Sairagul Sayutpe, here's more about the camps in China's northwest. Thanks to years of poverty, the images of Xinjiang that China wants the world to see. Beijing says their so-called education centers provide valuable vocational training, job opportunities to eradicate poverty in the region. The centers, it's claimed, are also a tool in China's war on terror, with programs to de-radicalize Islamist extremists and ethnic separatists. That's the official view, but stories from eyewitnesses tell a different story. They describe detention camps and the repression of an estimated one million Uyghur Muslims, subjected to forced labor, torture and cultural indoctrination. A growing body of evidence points to massive human rights abuses in Xinjiang, abuses that Western leaders say China can no longer hide. The atheist Chinese Communist Party has tried to convince the world that its brutalization of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang is necessary as a part of its counterterrorism efforts or poverty alleviation, depending on which audience that they are speaking to. Accusations that Beijing brushes aside as international meddling. We urge US politicians to respect the facts, stop fabricating lies and stop using Xinjiang-related issues to interfere in China's internal affairs. China has shown no sign of winding back its policies in Xinjiang. In fact, satellite images show the network of detention facilities appears to be expanding. And military-style labor camps are now being reported in neighboring Tibet. Chinese leaders have hailed their policies a success, but harrowing first-hand accounts only reinforce the widening gulf between Beijing's claims and the truth behind these walls in Xinjiang. It is a truth that Sairagul Sayutpe has seen for herself. An ethnic Chinese Kazakh, she worked as a director for several preschools in Xinjiang. That was before one night in November 2017, when she was whisked off to a re-education camp in the region. There, even though she was a prisoner herself, she was forced to teach Chinese to other inmates. She was eventually released four months later, after which she fled to neighboring Kazakhstan, and then eventually to Sweden, where she was granted asylum. A quick clarification here, Sairagul refers to Xinjiang as East Turkestan in this interview. That's based on Uyghur and Kazakh people's claims that the region is an independent country. Ms. Sudbai, thank you so much for speaking to DW News. Now, you were taken to a re-education camp in Xinjiang in 2017. What were the charges against you? <laughs> They started to harass me in January 2017. The Chinese Communist Party had already begun enacting its genocide policy on Uyghur and Kazakh minorities in the fall of 2016. The Communist Party had been planning this crackdown years in advance. They started to arrest people in the middle of the night. My friends and my relatives started to disappear. In January 2017, I also became a victim of this fascist policy for no reason. The police arrested me multiple times at night. They questioned, pressured, threatened, and hit me. They used my family, who was abroad at the time, to blackmail me. 
They asked me to bring my family members back from Kazakhstan to China. I refused. That in November 2017, I was forced to enter the internment camp and to teach Chinese to the inmates. But the Chinese government says that you were never in any of these camps. In fact, uh, the Chinese embassy in Sweden had uh, this to say about you, and I quote, she never worked in any vocational education and training institutions and had never been detained before she illegally fled to Kazakhstan. What do you say to that? Everyone who knows the evil side of the Communist Party knows very well. The Chinese government will use whatever means to pursue and defame those who have witnessed and revealed the evil side of the regime. This is normal. I don't care. Since hearing these false claims and verbal attacks, I actually felt happy. Why? Because it means my testimony actually had an impact. Now, you co-authored a book about your time in these re-education camps. Uh, it's called uh, The Chief Witness Escape from China's Modern Day Concentration Camps. What did you witness there? After I was brought to the fascist internment camp, I realized that it was an abyss, a nightmare. I know it's hard to believe. If I had not seen it all with my own eyes, I would not have believed it. How can something like this happen in the 21st century? There were about 2,500 inmates in my complex. Men, women, young and old, all of them were innocent. They had not committed any crimes. The Chinese Communist Party made up their wrongdoings. They were forced to make false confessions. All of them had their head shaved. Their limbs were shackled despite injuries. They had to endure psychological torture as well as physical torture that was extremely brutal. I know it's a difficult subject, but can you tell us what kind of torture you're talking about? You spoke about psychological and physical torture. What did you witness? CCTVs were everywhere in the internment camp. There were four surveillance cameras, one in each corner of the cell, plus one in the middle. So there were altogether five cameras in one single cell. CCTVs were all over the corridors as well. Every action of the inmates was watched 24-7. But there was one room in the camp that didn't have CCTV. They call it the black room. People who enter the room were tortured physically by various brutal means. The guards would pull off their fingernails. They would tie them to a chair and use electric shock to torture them. They would beat them up. The means were very brutal. I used to be locked in that room, too. You were in a unique position. You were a prisoner in a re-education camp, and you were also a teacher over there. How did you cope with this dual role? 
I was a prisoner who was forced to teach Chinese. Although I had a different designation, but in fact, all the restrictions and rules I had to follow were just the same as all the other inmates. What is the worst memory that you have from uh, the roughly four months that you uh, spent in this camp? Uh, there's lots of things that I will never forget. Every time I eat, I think of the inmates. I think of them before I go to bed every night. My mind keeps returning to the internment camp where I worked every single day. One thing that I can't stand, a very young girl, she got raped a lot. It really struck me. I can never forget it. It stuck in my mind. I can imagine um, it is a hard subject to recollect, but you are here in uh, Germany now, and you had a public hearing in the German parliament. What do you expect from Germany? I feel very honored to be able to speak at the parliament in this public hearing today. I also want to thank the German government for providing a chance for the people of East Turkestan to speak up. I have three demands for the German government. First, I hope the German government will act like many other countries and recognize the crimes the Chinese Communist Party has committed against our people as genocide. Second, I hope the German government will punish the leaders of the Communist Party according to the Magnitsky Act, a very powerful bill. Third, Germany is a very free, democratic, justice-loving and strong country. I hope the country will stand with people of East Turkestan. I hope they will take actions that are effective to save us. I hope the German government can answer to these three demands. If they really want to help, they will be able to do so. But do you really expect any action, any concrete action from the German government, given that in 2018, for example, bilateral trade between Germany and China was nearly 200 billion euros. That is a lot of money that we're talking about. And also, this is a time when the EU as a bloc wants to uh, make a trade deal with China. Do you think your expectations faced with these trade realities have any weight? The German government and the Chinese Communist Party have very strong trade ties. I'm well aware of this. Besides Germany, many other countries also have trade ties with China. But if you compare money and interests to the lives of human beings, 
Which one is more important? Life is short. We only live once. We might not reincarnate after death. If we turn a blind eye to what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing to the people of East Turkestan and don't act, then we will also become accomplices. I think there are still a lot of ways to strike a balance. For example, make human rights and the lives of the people of East Turkestan as the highest priority. Use this as a premise or condition to strike trade deals with the Chinese government. I think this is fair. If the world doesn't act right now, we will lose our ethics as human beings as well as our sense of justice. What is a world without justice? So people in East Turkestan or people in Hong Kong or Taiwan and many other places we all strive to put people's interests above all other things. We do that so we can have a world that is free. I hope the people of the world will understand that it is a decisive time for their freedom, democracy and their destiny. If we don't act now, the destiny of East Turkestan today will become the destiny of Hong Kong tomorrow. The future of Hong Kong might be the future of Taiwan. The fascist policy of the Chinese Communist Party is expanding to the rest of the world. I hereby call on the world to take action and stop the fascist genocide policy of China. Senator Gould, thank you very much.